Hi, Lynn. Can you hear me? Lynn. Oh, I can't hear you yet. Oh, sorry. Hi, Carl. Are. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you very much. Sure. Welcome, everybody. Let's see here. Good All evening. Right. Good evening, guys. Mike. This is Harsh Kajriwal. Hey, Ma. Hey, Harsh. Hey, Carl. Let's see. We Mike, you are new. But I'm coming in quick, so we'll give just a minute longer. We'll give people more time, yeah. Hope you guys are doing well this evening. This weekend in Austin, Texas, it's going to be 98 degrees. It's too early. Uh, it's too early. early. Well, it's the 90s today, right? 90. I know, something. but 98. Oh. Hey. Yeah, Kirk and I went riding bikes this morning, and I think it, it was like 5:30. We did, we have this seven seven mile loop in downtown Austin, and great workout, bunch of guys, but it it was a little toasty. Like it was oh, right. even then at 5 30, it was. I wish it, it, it would have been nice if it was cooler. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, back, uh, I'll tell you, back in 95 or 96, we came up with, uh, uh, we sold software to General Dynamics and they were designing the AC, kind of small AC that was like uh, built into jackets of uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. It was circulate the cold water ah. and keep it cold. This was for, no, soldiers in Kuwait and everywhere else for U.S. soldiers. So I think I good. have one of those, Harsh. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I have a heated vest, yeah. <laughs> it to keep it sounds heavy if it's circulating water. <laughs> yeah, it's a thin layer, and it, uh, they won't disclose what the principle was, but it was some kind of a liquid. Still can't disclose it water. government contract. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm sure we're going to have some other ones trickle in, but I want to head, go ahead and get started. I, I think I know most of you. There's probably one or two that I'm just now meeting. My name is Kirk Avery, and I live here in Austin, Texas. Oops, hang on a second. Let me let some other folks in. And uh, my partner, who you, you see on the screen, is Mike Craig with Steeple Rock Partners. We go way back. Uh, I actually went to college with Mike's wife. He lives right down the street. Our kids grow up together. We've known each other for quite a long time and have been <clears throat> involved in real estate for the last several years in one way uh, or another. Um, and our partner in this deal is Harsh Kejrawal and I'll let Harsh introduce himself in just a minute. We, uh, so Steeple Rock, me and Mike and Harsh have worked on many deals in common. And about a year ago, we formed a partnership uh, to build a hotel in Estero, Florida which is uh, breaking, getting, breaking ground any, any week now. And uh, we are proud to work with Harsh again uh, to present a land deal. Uh, you know, there's, there's, we're not making any more land, that's for sure. <laughs> but it's in high in demand. And as long as people and businesses are moving to Central Texas, land will be a premium. And I think that's one of the exciting things about this opportunity. So uh, Mike and Harsh, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Mike, why don't we go to you first? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the deal. It's not complicated. Uh, it'll only take a few minutes. We wanna really leave the bulk of our time to answer as many questions as possible. And um, Harsh is gonna do the heavy lifting on going through the deck and answering a lot of the questions though. Mike and I will chime in as appropriate. So Mike, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Mike Krieg. I'm one of the managing partners with Steeple Rock Partners. As Kirk said, we've been doing uh, real estate more on a commercial basis since probably 2017. And um, I'll say this, we're really excited at this point. Um, you know, we are about to have our 10th exit uh, from an acquisition we picked up back then. And across those 10 exits, um, you know, the simple average is about 24% IRR. So we're really excited to, to be seeing a lot of the results that we've been working hard for the past several years. Um, and I want to remind folks, because I know that not everybody knows us, and I, this is going to be recorded and shared with folks who are not super familiar with Steeple Rock, but uh, one, of the, one of the things that makes us different is we, we basically have a strategy that is a three, it's a three-pronged approach. Um, the first thing we do is look at markets. Uh, we we want to be investing in places that are growing. Uh, that means business growth. Businesses are migrating 
into these areas and also household growth. Um, and you'll notice many of the deals that we have done ha have been in the Sun Belt from Arizona across Texas, Georgia, and into the Carolinas. These are the markets that we are uh, excited about. It's where a lot of the growth is happening. Um, so we really start with that. And we feel like, by the way, each of these are really a hedge against uh, against our equi equity. We want to we want to really preserve our wealth. And as we go into deals, we want to make sure we're hedged. So market growth is a good hedge. The, the second thing is really good teams. Um, you can have a really good real estate deal or a piece of real estate, but if you don't have a really good team operating it, managing it, um, it's not going to go well. And we've seen that whether the market's been a good market or whether the market has uh, not been so great. Um, we've seen really good teams manage through a terrible market and provide a really good return. Um, so we like to do deals with partners and operators and management teams and brokers who are really the best at what they do. Um, and I think in this case, you're going to find as we go into this, um, Harsh and his team, um, they're just a fantastic team of, of Traveled with Harsh, um, gotten to know him. Um, he's a man of character and just really enjoy spending time with him. And um, he's, he's just very capable and very uh, competent in what he does. Uh, last thing is, is really just the deal itself. You know, looking at what kind of debt is in the deal, um, what, uh, what are the opportunities, what are the, what are the business plan, what's the business plan, um, how do we add value? So that's really our approach. Uh, we've done that for five years. And like I said, we've done uh, fairly well. It's working really well for us. So um, we're very, very excited about that um, as we're seeing a lot of that fruit uh, come out now. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say. I think we'll turn it over to Harsh and let him present this opportunity. And, and again, this opportunity is one that fits our criteria. We, you know, we, we have seen um, a lot of the growth here locally and we're excited. I, some of these deals that are outside of Texas, uh, some of the land that, that may be acquired. I think Harsh, Harsh can um, uh, go into detail on that, but um, this is one that meets our criteria and we're excited about it. So with that, I will, Harsh, turn it over to you and you can take us through the deal deck. All right. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, good evening, guys. Uh, this is Harsh Kajual. I'm based out of Austin, Texas. And uh, uh, we formed this new venture, Optim Venture, and I partner with uh, Joe Williams, uh, Richard Gary, and Carl Kessler. I've done a number of deals with them, and uh, we started our partnership last year. And we were doing one-off each land parcel deal in around Austin. And then we have done a couple of deals in Kissimmee, Florida. And we're looking primarily 60-70% of our deal will be in Texas area, and a couple of other deals will be a uh, very opportunistic uh, Southern Sun Belt where we are very comfortable. We know the area well. And historically we have done purchase the land parcel and then subdivided the land into like say multifamily in the back, commercial in the front, hotel pad sites or a retail high-end office pad sites, getting the entitlement done, getting it all platted, getting this uh, approved by the city getting civil and the architect done, water sewer permits done, and, and then adding all the value and then selling the parcels. Sometimes we end up selling the entire uh, land. Like if we acquire 200 acre land parcel, instead of subdividing into five acre lot, which we can, or we do a conceptual plan, do a rendering, getting the water and everything all down from the city, and then sell it to a bigger developer. For a very decent return. So we have hey, done a number of these and we can go over the cases. Hey, Harsh, let me know when you want to dive into the deal deck, okay? Yeah, you know, let's go to the deal deck because uh, I don't want to bore you with uh, too much introduction. And while, while we're on the deal deck, we can go over okay. some of the case studies and everything else. Perfect. You want to share the slides? Absolutely. And we don't have to wait for the questions uh, towards the end. If somebody has a question, feel free to ask along the way. If something is not clear, I'm happy to. We can keep it very informal. All right. So go ahead to the next slide now, Kirk. All right. Hang on a second. Here we go. Yeah, these are just uh, 
standard disclaimer, just to make sure that we all understand everyone have to be an accredited investor. By that, I mean, you guys have invested in uh, private placement in the past. You have a net worth of at least a million or your combined income, husband or wife has to be at least 300,000. So you all have to be an accredited investor. Uh, so that's just a disclaimer moving on. So why buying land? I mean, what's the main key? We have partnered with Joe Williams. He's the founder of Keller Williams. We have very good network of not just a realtor, but we get call from different sellers all the time and for us to take a look at the land and what the value of the land is. Sometimes we pick up the land, majority of the time, in fact, we pick up the land off market. So before it hits MLS, we can put a bid on it and we don't get into a bidding war. That's where you end up getting like, uh, you get very passionate and you end up paying a higher price for the land than it's actually worth. So we generally pick up, uh, we have a very good networking way of sourcing. We have a good way of validation. And then we have a good team on execution. Like by that means we have connection with land attorney, entitlement people. We have good connection in the city. We know the mayor, we know the commissioners that we talk all um, year round basis, that we know what to do. We have good source of, uh, when we're trying to dispose of, we have a good network of people that we can sell to developers, like you name it, the bigger biggest developer in Austin, all surrounding areas. We have sold land or we have some relationship in place. So we have the way we can sell the land as well as we can acquire the land. So when we are even developing, when we're getting the entitlement, we work with these developer to see what they really want. So before sometime we go into entitlement process, we are able to get the land under contract. And as soon as the land is under entitlement is done or the water sewer is done, the land is already sold. They have already gone under contract. They've given us the hard money. So our risk is eliminated. We can move on to the next slide. So basically what I've been saying is we leverage our market, leverage our network to find, identify the land. This is the funnel. Like you, the biggest thing is to find the right land in the path of the right growth. Then putting the projection, making, making sure that you're not left hanging with the land and then putting a proper deal structure together, making sure that if you are holding the land more than about two years or three years, your carrying cost for the land is less. And if you see in our deal terms, we are carrying costs is 50-50. We are not over leveraging. Though the banks are qualifying us to borrow only 35% equity and 65% debt, we are not over leveraging it. Because if the interest rate continue to rise, I mean, right now it's really small, like 4%, 4.5% is what the debt we got uh, already approved for $25 million revolving debt. So we are pretty safe. But if the interest rate is to rise in say next year, year uh, after that, say five, five and a half percent, our carrying cost of the land will be higher, just the interest rate portion. Most of the land that we pick up are act exempt anyway. So the taxes on the those pieces of land are very small. So we're not too worried about that. So uh, the idea is getting the land, identify, do all the R&D during the due diligence and do not, buy the land until you are very comfortable that you can sell the land. Sometimes as soon as we buy, we get the land under contract and then do the due uh, entitlement and getting all the city permits and everything. So as we like at least get one or two parcel of the bigger chunk, suppose we buy like a 20 acre land. Uh, front retail, if we carve out say five or six acre, we try to get that under contract as much as possible quickly. So we, our risk is eliminated. We, are, we have got maximum return on the capital already back or the capital back. And then we can play for the backside as a multifamily, which may take almost nine months to get the entitlement. And then we start marketing that land within six months to uh, seven months just before getting the entitlement. So we make sure we sell the entire piece of land in about 12 months. So with the uh, gain to all the investor, including us, is a long-term gain, not a short-term gain. Go ahead. This is about them. 
No, Triple Rock. So here's the Joe William, Richard Gary, myself, and Carl Kessler. Carl Kessler joined our team. He's one of the senior executives from IBM, retired, and he has managed billion dollar worth of PL and had about 600 people plus for each of the business units working for him. He is going to be acting for us as a CFO. He has done a number of deals with us, about seven to 10 plus deals we have he has done with us. I myself has a lot of background in the high-tech area. I ran a worldwide sales for Arc International. The company got purchased by Synopsys and then by Virage Logic. And then I ran a software engineering services team with HCL. I was there with them for seven years. And since now, now, now I have been doing this full time for the last five years. And Richard Gary and I worked together at Virage Logic. I've known him and Joe William, obviously, he's the founder for Keller Williams. And he has done a number of deals, and we are all equal partner in this deal. So it's very nice to Joe and I. We have done a number of deals together, and we decided instead of doing one off deal, we decided to do put together a land fund. So most of our investors do not miss out on the single yeah, land deals because each of the land deals that we have floated, we were oversubscribed within a day. Every land deal that we did, like 7 million, 10 million, 15 million. We look for capital on a $15 million deal, say 4 million equity. We were oversubscribed within a day. So now we decided, okay, instead of doing land by land, we decided to do a fund. And that way we will have the capital. We can go to the market and capture the better deal at a better price and diversify. Go ahead. Yeah. So we have been doing this. I mean, these are, you can read it at your leisure. We are expecting IRR anywhere from about 25% to 33% IRR. And it's a straight split. And uh, class A member, they will get 65% profit of every deal. And 35% of the deal profit will be going to the general partner and managers. And once you hit two X return, like if you invest at 200,000, and by deal by deal basis, if you cross two X of your initial capital that you contributed, then it will get split 50-50. That is more of a place order, but I expect it will, out of the five deal, we may hit on one deal, but not on all of the deal. Uh, so we are not to exceed on the leverage 50% loan to value. And we are playing a little bit more conservative. Yes, in the past, we have even leveraged 65%, but no, I think, uh, on the safe south side, it's better to be on a 50-50%. And the 50%, we are also estimating that cost of like, uh, or expenses to do the due diligence and the permit fees and everything. So now uh, we're playing a little bit more safe on these deals. And we will, as a general partner, we will co-invest $1 million in the deal. At least minimum 1 million, we probably will be investing a lot more. Okay, so here's the invested capital, 25 million. Total project acquisition, we expect it will be around 46 to 50 million. We'll be acquiring it. Total exit value within two to three years time frame, about 78 million. So basically, on a $25 million investment, we expect about roughly about $28 million profit, uh, approximately. And Cost for horizontal development, brokerage fee, debt service acquisition, disposition. And in this fee, you have geotech, permits, uh, land attorney, and entitlement fee. You have soil, cultural, you name it. All kinds of fees are built in. And uh, acquisition, financing, origination fee, everything we are estimating to be around 8.6 million or all the land fund that we will be acquiring. So on the low side, we expect anybody investing say 200,000 to get the 300,000 and this will get distributed as we dispose of the land. Suppose we first land we acquire in July of this year, we expect the land to be sold by next July, August, September, sometime 12 to 15 months. And that cap portion of the capital will be returned back to investor along with their profit. So you should start expecting return on the capital and the return starting next year. Uh, say we will close this fund, say June, July, 
And by next year, July, August, September, we should start seeing disposing of each piece of land parcel. And we expect by third year, we should be, end of third year, we should be done with the entire fund and dispose of all the land pieces. And we are making three capital calls. So if anybody uh, say comes in and say the minimum like uh, under 50,000, uh, you have a 30% commit. So you will deposit 45,000 now and we'll do two other capital call as we go along. And uh, the second capital call will be in September. It could be in October. It could be sooner, but it could be, it will be all done within 12 months. So what we don't want to do is get everyone's commitment and sit with a lot of money in the bank. We want to make sure we acquiring the land or these land parcel right time, right place in the path of growth. If the economy takes a downturn, then we acquire the land at that point. We don't want to rush because the money is sitting in the bank. We want to make a proper decision with and look at the market condition and acquire the land uh, in the path of growth, in the path of uh, where we can get the maximum return. We don't want to rush because everyone committed the capital and just acquired the land. That's why we're making capital call and we'll, uh, and that way your IRR will be higher and we will make a, a proper decision instead of rushing it. Go ahead. Oops, sorry, I'm back. I think that's pretty much it. I mean, um, yeah, I think the rest of it is just, you know, talking about. Okay, so the, I'll tell you the, one of the case, couple of case studies that we have. Keep going down. I think it's a Kissimmee for Florida one. We just recently put it under contract. The next one. Yeah, this one. If you see, we acquired this site plan. This was in Kissimmee, very close to Disney. Uh, we acquired this uh, land about approximately 17 acres. Uh, piece of land and this was we acquired for seven million dollars and we subdivided the retail path site and the hotel path site for 2.3 acres and 0.7 acres for uh, Starbucks and the back portion we subdivided into 300 plus units multifamily and we as, uh, we acquired this land in December we are already under contract with the multifamily and the hotel as well as the a retail path site to dispose of the entire piece of land about 14 point sum or 15 million. So investors could expect roughly they invested 100,000, they were expecting 190,000, they will be given to them. So it's a, it was a pretty good return. And we leveraged 50-50 in this one, and we took a loan of about 3.8 million on that. And uh, we spent about 600,000 on entitlement, civil, architect, water rights, everything else, and it's still going to entitlement process by September of this year, we should be done with all entitlement. And then uh, Allied Orion, the, one of the big developer, uh, they are going to be building a multifamily apartment complex there. And the hotel will be built in front and the Starbucks will be second after that. Good. So we are under contract with all of them. And I think the rest of the slides are, well, yeah, they're just more examples of, of things that have, uh, you know, previous deals. Let's spend a few minutes, let's spend some time now answering some questions. No questions are off limits. And, I'll, and while you're thinking of a question um, of your own, I'll go ahead and start because this is a question I've had uh, once or twice uh, that I think is a good question and it's worth asking. Uh, why 6535? In other words, uh, you know, there's been other deals floated around town that are 80-20 with no, no bank debt. Uh, yeah, so you just bank said bank? it yourself. Like, if you do not have a bank debt, there's no leverage. Mm -hmm. There's no risk to general partners, right? Then your returns are much lower than that you can get 80-20. In this case, we are taking 25%, 50% uh, debt, 25 million debt. For under 25 million, we're giving bank only 5% interest. In fact, 4.5%. So, and the 4.5%, you're getting all the rest of the return. So let's just say our average return is 25%. Yeah, right? But the bank only got 4%, 4.5%. Uh, 
the balance of the 20% has been returned back to the investors. That's why we are giving 65, 35%. We can afford to give 65, 35. In the past, like Florida deal, we did 50, 50% because we took all the debt in personal loan, right? And this one, we're giving 65, 35 split because we can afford to, and when with a bank debt of 25, 50%. So the deals that you see in the market that are 80, 20, they don't take the debt. They don't take the risk. They're not taking the risk on their head. And that's why their returns, they think they can give you because all they're doing is just facilitating. They're buying the land, holding it. They're not even doing anything in Taiwan. They think they're telling you, okay, we could do bringing the water. It's a more of a hopeful deal that they buy and hold it and the land will go up in the value or the water will come or the sewer will come. We're not doing that. We just not just holding and sitting on it. Yes, we could do that if it's in the path of right growth and in one year, the water and sewer are just coming to us, but it's not a hopeful deal. We are buying land and doing the work, making sure, getting all the entitlement, getting the planning done, talking to the city, everything has been done by us. We have all these expenses, but at the same time, we are adding a lot of the value so that we can dispose of the land quicker and not just hold and pray, if that makes sense. It does. All right, I wanna open it up to you guys. What are some other questions you have about the deal structure, about uh, the plan, anything? Uh, I had one question. Uh, this is Mrs. Kambampati from uh, Houston. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I had a question. Um, it said, uh, yes, the minimum investment would be 150 for a class A member. Uh, and uh, it is 30% uh, initially and the next two will be in the 12 months. Uh, for some unforeseen reasons, if we are unable to keep, uh, keep up with this particular contract and uh, won't be able to do the other two uh, 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 Mm, installments. Yeah. What would happen uh, to someone like that? You know, how, how, how would you go about that? Well, we haven't had the situation yet <laughs> in other deals that we have done. We did, uh, I just finished off a $50 million. We did $50 million raise on a storage fund. And uh, if it is like a very hardship, somebody is not able to do it, then hopefully another investor can step in and you will lose your interest in whatever you paid. And suppose we sold off a land and you're not gonna get the gain, you may get your principal back. And if there's no investor taking your deal or they may discount it, suppose you paid out of 150, you paid 50. Now I'm just making it hypothetical because we haven't come across this situation. Suppose you did put 50, right? And you're not willing to put another 100. Another investor may step in and willing to buy your 50,000 for 40,000. So you lost your 10,000. Right, or if the fifty thousand became seventy thousand, believe me, Krishna. Right now, I'm gonna buy your fifty thousand share, no problem. <laughs> so, both scenarios it can happen. Uh, uh, so, the way we write in the PPN in the legal that your shares will be discounted and will be given it to another member, basically because legally we will have to make sure that once you're obligated, you cover your shares because we will be bidding on the second piece and third piece and other pieces of land based on commitment, right? But that's what, I, if somebody has a hardship and they have an issue, believe me, we'll do the right thing and give the money back and bring in new investors. This that's was just, really, I just uh, Yeah, I know it's a fair question. We had a fair question. And, I had that question long back when I did it. Uh, so it's fair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kurt uh, or Harsh, this is Dave Edwards. Hey, David. Yeah. And uh, I had a question is your, for instance, your Kissimmee uh, project, is that pretty typical uh, in that you're looking to develop it and sell it to a, a multi family developer or? a build to rent developer uh, and then have some of it in commercial. Is that pretty typical of the, what you see happening? Yes, uh, I would say a good 50% of these deals will happen like that. I'll give you another example. We bought Liberty Hill 250 acres 
and we bought it at uh, 32,000 per acre. And, and we were gonna divide it into like a single family lot, uh, RV park and an airfield, uh, air ranch. Uh, it has a small strip to land small planes and air hangars. But a big developer came in, they said, no, no, nothing doing. I'm gonna take the entire 245 acre and subdivide into a single one acre lot because we already had water on it, commercial well on it. So he says, we'll do it in three phases. I don't want any RV next to it. I do not want any airfield next to it. I'll do single family lots in three phases. Hats off to him, he buys it. Uh, he puts the entire 245 acre under 80,000 per acre. Within one year, we are out. So we just put that under contract so that can happen. So, uh, and like uh, we have another piece of land that is uh, uh, at the intersection of 81, uh, 45 and 130. You guys are all familiar if you're in Austin, uh, near the freeway, right? Uh, it's an 81 acre, it's been divided into multifamily in the back, a seat and hospital on the left side, commercial and office space. So if commercial guys say, hey, I want bigger office space, yeah, they can have that. So the zoning, you can downgrade it, but you cannot upzone it. Upzone will take longer. So we try to do the best use case and then let people decide what they want to do with it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. And, and do you anticipate most of the deals being in Austin, in the Austin area? I would say good all around Austin. It could be all four partners are Austin. We have very good connection in Austin. I have very good connection in Florida and Arizona. So Santa Fe, we have done a few deals there. Say so if a deal makes sense, then we'll do it, but primarily South. Like we'll do some Carolina, one or two deal here and there. But primarily, I would say 80, 70, 80% will be in Texas. It's a growth uh, area. I mean, you can't go wrong here, right? At, at least for now, two, three years. Hi, Harsh. Uh, this is Vijay Thoreddy. Uh, thanks for meeting. A hey, uh, couple of questions. Uh, you know, as you know, the land in, in an Austin area, it's all already, all the prices are so up, and whatever you're going to buy, it's all priced in right now. So yeah. how much how much we can expect? I mean, say you know, already prices have gone up five five x I think per acre, you know, minimum. So do you think do you think you still there's there's still a lot of room here, or you're going to go outside Austin, maybe suburbs, or you know, or like that? Or do you have any? And also, do you have any land parcels right now you're going to buy with this fund? Yes, we have multiple land parcel that we will buy, a couple of land parcel we are aggressive looking. So not necessarily we are looking to buy in downtown Austin. Uh, there are areas that are still available, right? We can go Wimberley, you can look, uh, you cannot touch driftwood. You, dripping Springs is expensive, right? But driftwood, uh, Wimberley is there, Kyle is there. Uh, there are areas where you know what's coming next you can buy there. Uh, but again, if you're hopeful that you just buy and it will just appreciate and you cannot, you don't do anything proactively, then those days are gone. Like right people bought it near Flugerville and they just sat on it. They didn't do a thing. And the land appreciated like two X in two years or one year, even three X in one year. Those days are gone, right? Because everyone is clever now. There's enough people doing the land deal. So none of our land deal we just bought and just sat and hopefully it became uh, expensive and we sold it. That's what I keep saying. We buy land, first of all, off market, then we do all the work, entitlement, platting, and getting it all ready so we know. And most of the time we are, we are doing the work in say three months, four months, five months, we already have land under contract, right? And then we co-develop with them saying, uh, we work with the multifamily developer, say six months in, buying the land while we're doing the work. Then he says, okay, don't do that three story. Can we do four story? Then they bring their architect and we code design it and then take it to the city and get it approved and then they buy it. And they've already gone hard. They've already funded our development, right? And if they don't buy it, 
we have a shovel ready project. So that's kind of like what we're trying to do as opposed to just buying expensive piece of land. Yes, some piece of land may be expensive. See, there are multiple stages. Like there are people who are buying land and flipping it. Then there are bu people buying it in entitlement and getting the work done and then it's selling it to so developer. So we're doing the two pieces, two portion of it and then selling it to developer. And we have the connection on the front as well as where to dispose of. Because what's happening is in the developer, they used to come to us anyway. I mean, when they come to us means Keller Williams guys and all these, they wanted land to sell. And we were helping them and getting them all these good piece of land and they were making money. We realized, hey, we're passing on so much benefit to these developer and we're doing onesies and twosies deal. Why not we do it ourselves? And hence we started buying some of these pieces of land ourselves. And we were doing entitlement work anyway. Then we said, okay, we have tried it with our own money. Like Kissimmee, Florida and all these, we, I put on my own money 700,000 and a lot of my partners, they put 300, 400,000 each. And we raised like maybe like 600,000 from outside. Only one or two close ones. We know, okay, we could do this. Then we raised capital. Liberty Hill, we bought 8 million all cash. We raised 4 million and 4 million was put in by close friends. Now we are at a point, okay, we can do this. And we have done this. And we started raising 81 acre, 81 acre, the 145, 130. We, we did it with two partners and we raised all the capital from investors. We bought that land at $5 per square foot. That land is being sold at $17 per square foot. We have not even marketed, we are getting offers because Seaton announced, and we knew Seaton is coming next door. The day Seaton breaks ground, I think we can sell that land for $22 per square foot. Easy. And you know, that is a prime location, right? 45 and 130. Yeah. So those are the pieces of land that you buy. Even if you're left holding the bag, the land value will not go down. That's, I mean, worst case scenario. So at least your principle is safe, or everyone's principle is safe. Uh, I have a question on this uh, loan to value, 50% loan to value. Can you explain on that? Uh, didn't quite Basically, understand. It's a $50 million uh, fund. So let's just say 50 million, we divide into five land parcel, 10 million each. 25 million is the equity and 25 million will be the loan coming from the bank. So we have a couple of uh, banks that are already approved and we are still shopping to see if we can get a better rate and better terms. But we have got for four and a half percent at this point. So the, and the return uh, we can expect within like 15 months to two years? Well, not average, all of it, average, but average. as we sell the land, as we sell yeah. each piece of land, you will start getting it. So expect about three years, you will get all your, if we dispose of all the land pieces, then you will get it all. You may get it sooner as well. Okay. All right. Thank but you. you will start getting in chunks, yes. Uh, what is the uh, liability for the investors? I mean, uh, only your investor capital is your liability. And there's nothing. You know, if You're all, a limited partner. You're a limited partner. Right. <clears throat> so, our like general partners, we will be also be investing. We will invest as a limited partner, but liability is with the general partner, four general partners. Ash, I, I have a question. For yeah. Some... Go ahead. Yes, when you say uh, this, a question about distribution, uh, you said uh, all profit distributions uh, is at the beginning is 65% and 35%. And then after achieving 2x return, then it will become 50 50. Right. Is this a hard hurdle or a soft hurdle? By that, I mean when, it, when, when the profits uh, exceed 2x, do you only, do we share profits 50-50 on the amount that's above 2X or do you go above back? 2X, above 2X. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So we have ran multiple scenarios. Believe me, it's a placeholder. I don't expect we hit 2X on each property. And mm -hmm. it is by property by property, not at the fund level. I see. And so another we, question, okay. Another question is, for example, in this, in this, in this fund, let's say we buy three, three, three land, three pieces of land. 
uh, in this fund. And, and um, let's say the first deal goes sour, go, go south. Okay. So uh, do, then do you, do you, then the, does the investor take the loss on the first deal? Right investor, there. Yeah. So investor will take a loss if the deal goes sour. If mm -hmm. the land, suppose we buy it at 4 million and it doesn't sell for five and six or seven, whatever we wanted, and it gets sold for 3.5. So it will be equally distributed, including our LP money, will get distributed to all the investors, right? Where, like, say, everyone on their Say on the on a 50 million that deal was only say 10 percent out of the 10 percent say 4 million which is almost like eight percent of the capital right everyone will take like a five or ten thousand dollar hit but on the next deal when you make money you can write off that loss against the profit so you, i mean it'll get balanced out so so you're saying uh if the second deal has a profit Right. We don't. We don't. We don't uh, necessarily pay the the loss first for the first deal, and then we distribute again. Or how? You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I see. But the way in the fund happens is: suppose you have a loss. There's no distribution per se. Only there's a profit. There's a distribution per. Will get distributed to all the investors. In the loss, yes, you incur small loss in each of the deal that will get allocated. Suppose there is only one deal gets sold, say this year itself, and that loss will show up on your K1 to start with. But when you make profit next time, it will get written off. So yes, the profit and loss are deal by deal specific, mm -hmm. but it will be as a fund. We have taken that into account. It will be at a fund structure. That's why it's all well diversified. Uh, but distribution will be made by deal by deal specific. So we don't expect a land to be sold at a negative or at a loss. We can hold for a while unless we find some problem with the land and we have to really justify a land loss, then we'll notify all the investors this is what's happening and we are taking a calculated risk and take a loss and move on. By sometimes that happens, or like so far, it's been we have been a very good market. So so far, it didn't happen yet. But if it does happen, then we are we will take a calculated risk and take a loss, and then move on to a better return. So we don't want capital to be stuck unnecessarily. But it is deal by deal profit and loss. But on an average, you should expect twenty five to thirty percent return IRR basis. Okay. And another question, do you have other other funds similar to this one running so, at the current moment? No, we, I have another fund for uh, storage. Uh, it's a $50 million fund in storage that pays 7% uh, cash on cash because there are, it's a cash flowing properties and it's an existing properties. And we continue to acquire, we have seven properties already on it and we are adding five more properties on it. Okay. But that will give about 15 to 17 percent IRR over a period of five to seven years. Mm. But those are more of a storage deal. Those are not land deals. Land deals tends to, like, on an average, though we are saying you will get 1.6 in three years, on an average, our land deals have been giving more than 1.6x in per year basis. Mm. So I'm not going to put that in the prospectus saying, hey, you're going to get 1.6. And then when you get 1.5 per year basis, you're going to be very happy. But then you'll be sad at the same time. Hey, you promised me 1.6 and I got 1.5. 1.5 is still a very good return. And every 1.6 deal that we have given, if you look at our prospectus, we have promised only 30, 34% return. And we're giving 60, 65% return to investors. They're very happy. Like Kissimmee, we're giving 1.9 1.9x in one year. But we didn't promise them 1.9. We promised 30% return on it, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. uh, we want to be safe and conservative, but doesn't mean I'm going to go bullish and say, hey, we're going to make double your money every year. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, this this oh. is Stephen Stephen Hurd. Uh, appreciate the, the yeah. time and the opportunity. This is a question for both Kirk and Harsh. What is the advantage to Steeple Rock and to opt in in this partnership between the two of you all? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are raising 25 million capital. We have a class A, B, and C shares. Uh, and class A shares are minimum investment. You can go 100, 150, 200,000. Class B shares are minimum is 2.5 million each individual. And class C is 7.5 million each individual. So Steeple Rock, and we have been working multiple deals in the past, Steeple Rock, are bringing their investor into this deal and they're buying a class B shares. And basically it's not a hit to any of your, their investor. So basically they're buying class B and giving you a way into the opt-in fund. And you're coming under their umbrella, they're eating up all the costs of a fund from their pocket and uh, Class B shares, they get, instead of 65, they get 70%, 70 30 split. So they get small, uh, like I would say, fee uh, from our share, from the general partner to bringing in all their investors into the pool as a class B shares. Does that help? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. So, so basically you, you can call it as a fund of a fund. And they saw the opportunity, I've worked with them. We're not extending this opportunity to everyone. I work with uh, my concurrent multiple opportunities. We have done four or five deals together. We just finished the uh, Fort Myers hotel deal. <coughs> where we were 50-50 part partners in that. And then we did that. And I've done multiple of these hotel deal and they wanted to get their feet wet in that. Uh, so. Here they are in the land fund. We're not exposing this class B C to everyone, but yeah, if a single investor wants to come in at a 2.5 or 7.5 million, we're happy to work with you as well. Right. Yeah, in, in addition to that, Stephen, uh, if this is what you're getting at, there, there is no advantage of going uh, straight to opt-in in around Steeple Rock, because uh, we're not uh, essentially, we're offering the same percentages, 65-35. Yeah, and also there, you know, we have no acquisition fee and no management fee as well on this. If, if I may, this is Dave Edwards, if I may ask one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Harsh or, or any of you, it's, it's, of course, we know Austin has been such a hot market for such a long time. And we know that with the continued growth here, there's a, a demand that is outstripping supply in, in lots of areas. But if the economy does turn down, which, you know, with, with what's going on on a national basis, that can eventually trickle down to Austin, no matter how hot the market is. How do you see that affecting uh, your plan and your program? So we expect there's enough demand for the next two to three years, at least in Austin and Southern Belt. Arizona, look at the Florida, some of the Carolina, there's a enough demand for houses and multifamily for next two to three years, right? People are moving from north, northeast, down south. And though people are working remote, like you see Twitter may be coming in here, Micron may be building a plant, Samsung is building a plant. These workers have to come. They're building a plant. Somebody got to work here, right? And all these Oracle guys, then Apple plant, these guys have not moved in. So these guys are gonna move in Austin eventually. The cost of living is less, right? So they will move all these and they're working only fraction of the population has so far moved and they've been, uh, all these headquarters are moving here. Tesla just started hiring, right? So there's a shortage of uh, all these single family built around multifamily. Any of the multifamily that you see been built is 90, 95% occupied, rents are going up. Yes, it will stabilize. You cannot keep paying $2,000 or $1,800 for a single bedroom rent. I totally agree. So that's why you're gonna go into suburb, you're gonna go into suburb where you can have a bigger house. You cannot keep paying in like 
every neighborhood 300,000, no, 300,000, 300 dollars per square foot for houses, right? Now, and 400,000 as you go closer to downtown, like Spice Road and uh, or B Caves and all these that are 500, 600,000, 600 dollars per square foot. So you're right, it may slow down. It will slow down in about a year, two year, three years with the interest rate rising. They it will make uh, it'll be difficult for individual to afford houses. And that's why these uh, built to rent houses, single family or multifamily uh, houses in the suburb will still do well. So we are, end, let's talk for just a minute about worst case scenario. So let's say the economy does tank, let's some, something unforeseen happens. All these companies are bringing here, people here have a hiring freeze and we're in a situation where we cannot sell these properties for, there's no premium buyer out there. So now land is going for the, we bought is going for 80% of what we bought it for. Let's play out the worst case scenario and what we do in that instance. Yeah, so by the time we have value added it, anytime when you get any of the land ready, shovel ready and you get permits and everything done, value of the land already doubles or at least it goes for a very high premium. And the way right now the market is, we're selling it at a three times the value, right? So if we do value add in any of the land, yes, we will not make the killing profit that we anticipate, but you still will be made, able to make decent return and not lose money. Just think if you would invest in a multifamily. I started doing this with a multifamily and we still hold three multifamily where we are giving 27, 28% return. Multifamily are going at a 4% cap, even lower 3.7 cap. How can you make money on a 3.7 cap? I mean, 4% cap, people are still investing in it. They're still hopeful that the value or the rent will keep going up. At some point it will plateau, right? At some point that's, you cannot afford a single bedroom or two bedroom for $2,400. You cannot earn enough, you're not earning enough that you can pay rent so much. So that's why people are building so many of these multifamily and all that. And they will be, these guys could be left hanging with their expensive multifamily class A. And they will not be able to afford the rent and they won't be able to raise the rent further. But I would, if they continue to raise rent, just think well, what will happen to the value of the land? That will go double and triple. That means there's scarcity of land. They want to build more. They have to build more houses. They have to build more multifamily. They have to build more retail. If first thing that tanks is the people who bought now these multifamily or the building, that will go down in the value. Not the land is what I'm trying. Because carrying cost of the land is less. Taxes on land is very minimal. Most of the land are ag exempt anyway. And if you do value add on the land, definitely do increase in the value. That's why we're playing in this particular vertical as opposed to building vert uh, going vertical. We will do only the horizontal work. We will not spend a lot of money on the land. It will be a lot of labor work, but as opposed to going vertical and putting a lot of land costs, if that makes sense. When you mentioned vertical cost, you mean build? Building, yeah. Like when we sell it to developer, that's there. Like we sell $7 million land and the, going back to Kissimmee, Florida, uh, they're buying 350 units at a $38,000 per door. Once your entitlement of the land is done, you're no longer selling the land by acreage. You're not selling the land by per square foot. You're selling by the land by door price. You're selling the commercial land much higher price because it's commercial retail. Office lands, they sell for a different price as opposed to uh, ag land or a single family lots. Like David Weekly, Lenar, they buy land and they subdivide into single family lots and they buy the single family lots for 20,000 and 60,000 each. Right? These are 60 by 40, 60 by 60 lots, small lots in a big acreage field, because the, 
for them, they have to go vertical. They have to get all the infrastructure, water, sewer, electricity, everything done. And that's when they go build the homes and then they sell it to individuals like us. Mm -hmm. So we right. sell the big parcel, subdivide it, get the entire infrastructure work, holding the horizontal. We don't even do the foundation. We don't even do the water and sewer. We just get it to the road and then the developer takes on and do the work. Mm -hmm. So our cost is minimal. We just get the permits. How much did that increase the value of it average? Doubles easily. Okay. And one, one more question on the same lines. Uh, hi, uh, this is Murli. Um, so, so the funding, that, what's the, what exactly the projection? Like, are we planning it, you know, looking at like maybe three, four land deals or is it kind of, we don't we, know yet or? We don't know yet. Honestly, I wouldn't, uh, uh, we expect to buy at least five, maybe six uh, parcel out of this, or maybe seven land parcel out of this. And we expect to buy all of them by within a year. Uh, and if economy really start tanking, and then we will not make the capital call, mm -hmm. that can happen too. But right now, all signs are good. Uh, we have bid on at least three, four different land parcel. And we are actively looking, we are in the front runners on a couple of them, but then somebody can outbid us, right? Uh, I was there this morning uh, out in Cal, looked at a 52 acre land parcel. It looks very good. Uh, we met with the city planner as well. It looks a fantastic opportunity. And then we also looked at a couple of pieces in Wimberley. Uh, it's a 210 acre to be subdivided into five acre lots and a very nice water body or a creek, dry creek and building a small dam on the corner and expensive houses can be built on a five acre lots each. Uh, but then we are competing with a Marvel studio there. But we put our LOI there for uh, 11 million. Uh, Marvel studio, what I heard even this afternoon, they're offering a little bit more, but if we have the money then we may win the bid. So we always we are always bidding mm -hmm. and we are trying to buy time to do the due diligence. So mm -hmm. it could be five parcel, it could be seven, it could be eight. We do not know, but we have identified two piece of parcel. If all goes well, we will acquire in July. Right. And understand that's part of the business, yeah. model, right? That's yeah. why we're not taking full 100% investment dollars right now. So we're taking 30% as a deposit, uh, and then as parcels come up, uh, those where the capital call comes in. Because last thing, we, we don't want to hold investor money. We don't want to hold $20, $25 million worth of cash. Uh, and you don't want us to hold that money <laughs> until we have identified a deal in or under contract, and now we can make that capital call. Okay. So how, how do we distribute the funds? Like, let's say we, we find a land and then, uh, I mean, you know, among the members, like, is it going to be like by unit or is it going to be like a bulk land? And then how, how do they distribute it? You know, let's say I commit for 150K and what am I looking at, you know, distribution wise? Mm -hmm. So suppose we buy five pieces of land, as I was saying, $10 million each. First land we sold for over 15 million, a 5 million profit. Like the $10 million land, we bought at a five million equity out of the fifty million dollar fund. Oh well, no, sorry. Yeah, fifty million dollar land we divide into ten million each. We sold the first land uh, at fifteen million, right? Your equity or everyone's equity was only five million in that land anyway. On a five million land, we made five million, right? The ten million became fifteen, but we only put five. Five was only uh, debt. So after taking all the expenses, let's just say debt expense, uh, impact fee, this and that, entitlement, land attorney, say about 800,000, let's just say million, right? A round number. So the 4 million will get distributed to all the uh, members, uh, the all the equity holder based on the shares. Like you may put 150, there are people who are putting 700,000, there are people who are putting 600,000. So they will hold certain unit number of shares, right? Pro rata, it, everything will get distributed to all the members mm -hmm. on a 65-35 basis. 
So 35% of the 4 million profit will go to general partners and 65% of the profit will get distributed to all the limited partners in that ratio. Then we move on to the second deal and a third deal and a fourth deal. Obviously your principal will come first and then the distribution of the profit. So principal for each of the deal will come to you first, like that 5 million will come to you and then the profit will be distributed. It's a pretty simple way that we do as everyone is equal limited partner and the distribution of the profit is based on 65, 35 split. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then the, so once we create the fund and this is all gonna be under one LLC, right? Um, mm -hmm. So- Fund will be under but, LLC, uh, but yeah. each land parcel will be under separate LLC. We don't wanna take liability of one land deal mm -hmm. into the LP. So each of the land we will acquire under separate LLC, but the owner will be LP. All of us will be the owner. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Anybody else? Hi, uh, this is Shubash. I was just wondering. So whatever the fund raising now is going to be going now is for future purchases or already existing projects. How this. All future purchases. All Thank future you. purchases. All future, so, we have identified a few pieces of land that we will close in July, August. Rest of them will be, we will identify as we go along. Not a single one is an existing one, no. So once we're trying to get some, like you said, land parcels are what we buying or selling, we're going to have right. some kind of this kind of Zoom call and the experience and explaining the to see what is going on, what are you guys going to get, all that sort of just the end of the deals, and then you just kind of after sold the property and end of the thing, then you're going to have a Zoom meeting. Or we're going to have intermittent Zoom meetings while we acquiring the land or selling the lands for the members. I don't know if you understand me. What I'm saying is this, okay, once we buy some land from this point, right, it's going to ease investor going to know Hey, we bought some land for this amount. Yes, we will be sending reports to you, everyone saying, hey, we acquired this piece of land, congratulations. Now you guys are all the owners of the land. Yes, you will be know, you will know. Absolutely. Oh, okay, so what are, what are the amount we paid for that land? And all yes, that? obviously you will get a report on a monthly, quarterly basis. Uh, there's no running p and uh, okay. There's no income coming oh, no. from the land per se, but yeah, you okay. will get an update every quarter from us and we'll send out the quarter. You will have access to the portal. You can see how the land is. I mean, it's not a multifamily. You cannot see if right. it's occupied 92% or 94, but yes, you will see the land holdings in the portal. Yeah, I, I'd say in typical, uh, typically when we have multifamily projects, we report on a monthly basis. This would probably be more of a quarterly unless, yes. unless uh, you know a, a parcel of land was purchased in the middle of then the we'll send it. Yeah. Land when forest. whenever we buy something, we'll give you an update. Whenever we sell the land is under contract, we'll give you an update. But definitely uh, 30 days after the quarter end, you will get an update as well. Yeah. We do it for all the investment. I have about 26, 27 approximately investment that I currently manage and we send it out. Mm -hmm. Our analysts will write the report and we send it out. So any target for this fund? Like we want to raise 20 million, 5 million, 10? We are raising 25 million total and uh, Steeple Raw guys are raising anywhere from two and a half million to 5 million in the deal. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and by the way, I have approximately 12 million. We launched the fund today, this morning and we have 12 million already committed. So by this morning, this. Commitment is happening, 12 million is committed, one class C and one class B is committed. So that's itself is about 10 million and they're bringing in. And a lot of the previous investors have started committing. Uh, so I think we will be good for next two, three weeks. We should be all good. Uh, the front runners always, because they have a track record, they have worked with us, so they have committed. New ones are joining in. Mm -hmm. So we should be good for next two, three weeks. I think we should be committed. Excellent. Guys, I know we all have families. I don't want to type any more of your time if I don't, but I also don't want to leave any questions, burning questions un, unanswered. So is there any last questions that you guys would like to have addressed? I have uh, one last question. 
Okay. Um, what? Uh, when would be the first uh, installment you're expecting from us? Mm. Tomorrow. Uh, uh, as soon as possible. Me, I'm not sure. As soon as possible. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you commit. Uh, uh, you will get the paperwork from Super Rock, but mm -hmm. um, you, it's a joke. Not tomorrow. You can come. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can soft commit to them and then you can transfer the funds in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. We do not have a land that we have to acquire right now, mm -hmm. but once it's all committed, the fund will be closed. So mm -hmm. we expect everyone to be funded by end of May, next couple of weeks. And then we'll, as the fund comes in, that means it's all there. And so it's almost like a first come first serve basis in case exactly. it's, it's going yeah, to be it is. Case, I guess. Yeah. yeah so, so out of 25, 12 is committed already within a day. Committed already. Uh, a day. But that doesn't mean it will go fast. That that fast. Mm -hmm. These are existing ones. They knew about this for a while. Right? Yeah, we, we have a short we have a shorter runway. Our our paperwork will be finished. Um, I think Monday, Tuesday we'll have our PPM out and ready for DocuSign. But I think in the meantime, between now and then you know, if, if, you, if you, you know, now's the time to sign up and make your soft commitments and, and so forth. I think it will fill pretty fast. And obviously what we don't fill, Harsh will fill. So um, probably sometime mid next week, I think we'll be ready to collect wires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, you guys can detect. I mean, we're not in a hurry, but I would say commit the soft mm -hmm. and then work yep. on the exactly. transfer of the money. Money is not the biggest we're not rushing to get people's money right now. So mm -hmm. bottom but line. But I will yeah. add that the soft commit is important because uh, that secures you a spot. That does a soft okay. commit does not obligate you to invest, but it does secure a spot so that if we do get filled up, those who soft committed first have first priority. Um, so I would say soft commit uh, you know immediately, uh, you know, as quick as you can. And then we will sort it out paperwork wise, middle of next week, funding before uh, the end of May. So, uh, so I don't, there's no urgency to fund uh, quickly, quickly, but there is some urgency of just raising your hand and saying, hey, you know, so we're going to soft commit at this and then we'll confirm that in the next few days that that is, we're going to make that soft commit firm, in other words. Okay. This is a question. Well, I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, since you, you you guys have so much, so many experience, so much experience on on the real estate deals, so uh, because eventually, when the when the land when the piece of land is sold, then the the profit will be realized. We will have capital gain, right? Mm -hmm. So, what I'm just curious, what do normally what do most investors do in do they invest with their own personal name? Do they because mm -hmm. or do they invest in other way to kind of defer the tax? Mm -hmm. or? So you're not deferring the tax. Uh, whether you invest, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say a disclaimer. I'm not a tax attorney or advisor, but you can invest personal name or an LLC. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You're going to have to pay the tax. The only way you don't have to pay tax is like if everyone decides to roll over the tax or roll over the fund into a 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to do on a fund level. We will have 100 plus investors. Everyone have to agree, you could do it, but we will try that most of the gain we'll have is a long-term gain. We sell the land in say 12 months mm -hmm. or so. So you will pay long-term gain and not an ordinary income. I see. Okay. So if somebody offers on a $4 million land and $12 million tomorrow, hey, we'll pay short-term gain and we'll distribute it. So mm -hmm. that has happened to us, yes. And Mike and Kirk, mm -hmm. Kirk they know. We have exited a couple of deals like that where we got an entitlement, everything done very quickly, and we sold it a bit too fast. And we ended up paying capital gain, mm -hmm. which is a good problem to have. But okay. uh, yeah. Whether you invest as a personal or a LLC, your liability is limited and your mm -hmm. gain is still being taxed because it's all go flow into your personal LLC. You are passive, right. you're not active. So you cannot deduct your running to the grocery expense or a gas expense or a meal expense that mm -hmm. way. Okay. You're not actively involved in the project. So you cannot, 
deduct those expenses for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. And I would say we do have a handful of investors that do invest through self-directed IRA as well. Right. You could do that and you don't have to pay tax that way, but it has to be self-directed. Right. Yeah. One, one question that's uh, along the logistical lines, uh, how, how, how quick do you get K-1s out? <laughs> uh, we get the K-1 out hopefully by March. Yeah. Uh, there are cases where we have delayed, but we'll give you an estimated K-1s or saying, okay, these are the estimated, you can take it. Uh, but we tried our best to get it out by now March. But don't take it to the bank always. Uh, there are uh, deals where we ended up doing 1031 and it was a small deal, small number of investors and then we had to delay it but we still give, we gave everyone a draft, K1, and it didn't change, so it was fine, but mm, <laughs> it's a difficult question of our web, yeah. webinar today because of we, there have been delays a few times in the past, so in I would say all the 60, 70% chance we'll get it, but there are chances that you may get late, yeah. Yeah, of all the opportunities that, that I've been a part of and been involved in, most of the K-1s come out in a timely manner. There are a few uh, that we've had to delay. Um, so it's, it's a difficult question to ask but, uh, or to answer, but uh, I think the principle is our, de our desire is to get them in a timely manner and not to string people along several months. Appreciate the honesty. You bet. <laughs> Things don't always work out the way we want them to, but know that that is our uh, intention. Besides the report, are we gonna have like a quarterly meeting? We can have a quarterly meeting, believe me. Uh, mm -hmm. When we send our report, half of them don't even open the report, but we have asked for meetings enough time. We love to hear from all the investors, uh, but they're happy with return and they're happy with the report. They don't generally show up, but we're happy to <laughs> jump on a call every quarter. Believe me, we are ready. We want in, we want to see investors. We want to have, meet them for lunch or dinner. You call, tell me when I'm available. Absolutely. But we will do it. Yeah, I, I would say that has not been customary on most of our deals. Yeah. It's always been via email. Um, if you want to have a conference. But the report goes out regularly, believe me, and we okay. can. Okay. We're happy to do calls, and I wanted Joe to join the call, but he was on vacation. I didn't want to disturb him today. Mm -hmm. But he's happy to jump on a call if you need. We can get him on a call as well eventually, and uh, we can talk. I would, and I would say the typical cadence is we'll send out a you know let's say a monthly or quarterly report, uh, and if someone has questions, you know then we make ourselves available to answer any questions. Right. That's great. Yeah. Communication is really, really important in this. I yep. mean, yep. I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll end with this. We take this very seriously. Okay. You, this is your hard earned money and we take it very seriously. And we're, um, we want to communicate very, very clearly and often, uh, you know, we are, uh, want to do right by our investors. And we're, again, we take that very seriously. So Shankar, we, uh, communication, I think, is paramount importance, and because you deserve to know what's going on, and you deserve to be able to get on the phone and talk to someone, or get an email answered very quickly, or to be able to set up a lunch and ask questions. And so, um, I think that uh, those of you who yeah. have worked with Mike or I or Harsh in the past, uh, hopefully, would say that that has been your experience. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. So I think next steps are this, uh, you know, some of you guys received an email from me, some perhaps through Mike, some through Harsh. Uh, I'd say in the next day or two, if you would you know, just send whoever initiated this conversation with you, uh, if you'll send an email to that person and, uh, and let us know if you'd like to do a soft commit. And then we will give you, we'll work on giving you more of a firm time frame of saying, okay, thank you for your soft commit. We have you down. We'll need your commitment to be firm by this date and paperwork will be done by this date and then funding by that date. So we will work on a firm timeline so there's not a lot of guesswork. But that's kind of your homework 
is to ask questions, continue to ask questions. Uh, you know, questions don't have to end when this meeting ends. Uh, you're always an email or a phone call away. And then when you're comfortable, if you're comfortable, make a soft commitment. And then we'll walk you through the process from there on out. Fair enough? Huh? Yes. Excellent. Yep. Bye. Thanks everyone Bye. for your time. Bye. Thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It. Thank you all. I really appreciate you guys having this. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Lynn.